Heritage Words, a podcast about how we engage with our ancestral languages in new and creative ways. Heritage Words is produced by the HUCJIR Jewish Language Project, which raises awareness about Jewish ancestral diversity through the lens of language. I'm your host, Sarah Bunin Benor. Today we're speaking with Rosita Mavashev, whose ancestral languages include Bukharian, Russian, and Hebrew. Rosita, I'll be asking you about your ancestors and those languages, but first, welcome to the show, and let's talk a little bit about you. Amazing. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, uh, a little bit about me. I currently live in New York. Um, I'm based uh, in Midtown East. Uh, I'm the executive director for Masa Israel Journey, um, which is a nonprofit based in Israel. And what we do is we bring Jews in the diaspora to Israel on all sorts of programs and experiences. Um, my background in education is I'm also a clinical therapist and a teacher and educator by trade. Um, and I love to travel. And I'm a big um, advocate for storytelling and public speaking. I'm also a motivational speaker. So this is really exciting. Um, I actually went on a heritage trip to Uzbekistan um, a few years ago. So I actually got immersed more in my identity and um, heritage. And I'm actually going to be staffing a heritage trip um, August 25th to Uzbekistan this month. So this is exciting to do all this and like bring it full circle. Amazing. Um, so your family is from Uzbekistan? Is that where they're from? Yes. So my family is from Uzbekistan, specifically Samarkand. So Tashkent is the capital, uh, but they're from Samarkand. It's a couple train, a couple hours train right away. Um, so like each city kind of had like their own little um, subculture, so to speak, of, of uh, Bukharian Jews. So like when you do meet a Bukharian Jew within the community, you kind of be like, oh, where is your family from? And then based on the city, you kind of know a little bit more about their characteristics and their traditions. But all in essence, like as a Bukharian Jew, they're definitely like a, there's a collective culture and Jewish heritage within that. Mm -hmm. So did your family migrate directly from Uzbekistan to America or through other countries? So it's an interesting story. So I have both my parents had separate um, uh, journeys. My mom specifically, her family was part of the Aliyah movement in the 1970s. She was only eight years old. Um, it was an interesting time for Jews um, in Uzbekistan under communist Russia rule, um, FSU, um, USSR times. Um, it wasn't so safe or um, pleasant being a Jew. Uh, fully. So they made the move and uh, migrated to Israel. My dad's family is interesting. His mom is an Ashkenazi Russian Jew from Belarus. His father is a Bukharian Jew from Samarkand originally. My grandmother ended up in Uzbekistan. She was an orphan from the war, ended up there um, at a very young age, met my grandfather. So like we, she really holds the like identity, may she rest in peace, of being a Bukharian Jew, even though she um, is technically Ashkenazi Russian, but to her, it's like what she was immersed in. She actually cooked incredible Bukharian food, so she definitely considered herself one. Um, but they, that family um, moved, uh, my dad moved to Italy while they were waiting for their papers. They lived in Naples for a little while. And then from there, once they got their papers, they migrated to the U.S. So that's how my dad ended up in the United States. Um, my mom in her 20s, um, her family moved to Ashdod, and then in her 20s, she was like, Israel's cool, not for me. Let me see what else is out there. She took some trips to the U.S. because she had family that didn't go to Israel, but migrated to New York. She moved here, loved New York, uh, met my dad, and they had gotten married like in their late 20s. So that's how like I ended up here. Me and my sisters were all born here. So um, we don't have that immediate connection, but we have it through our parents. Mm -hmm. And did you grow up in a Bukharian community? Um, yes, and uh, I grew up in Borough Park, which is very interesting. It's not your typical like large Bukharian community, because when you think of Bukharian pockets in the US, especially in New York, you'll think Queens, right? Like it's a huge Bukharian constituency there. So that's where most people are. But my mom's family lived in Borough Park. So that's where she had moved. And that's where um, my dad actually lived in Queens. But then when he, they got married, they moved to Brooklyn and they lived in Borough Park. So that's really um, uh, where I was raised, but there was a very, very small Bukharian community. There were a few um, synagogues that we were a part of and in the community, but it was very small compared to like Queens. Okay, so did you did your family go to one of those 
Bukharian synagogues? In we did. Europe? We went to a few of them, depending on like what we liked and um, the holidays. Uh, we did the one one main one that we had went to was uh, on 41st and right off 13th Avenue. Um, it was the Niazo congregation. And then another one that we had gone to was on 45th and 12th Avenue. It was like not in a basement, but in a, a kind of a basement shul, very small congregation. It was the Chuck Chaco family. So that's how like we had names for these synagogues based on the families that would like lead them, but they were Bukharian based. So, yeah. Okay. Well, the Jewish language project did a walking tour of Queens led by mm -hmm. Menashe Chaimov and yes. uh, who, who was the one who introduced me to you. So uh, thanks to Menashe. And um, we're also going to be doing a walking tour of Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn uh, in, uh, in September. So uh, very, very exciting. Lots, lots to see in New York. Um, yes, so yeah. what about school? What kind of school did you go to? Um, so I was raised in Borough Park. Uh, my mom had sent us to Basalco of Brooklyn for elementary school. Um, it was really for like geographic purposes. It was right across the street. We would just have to cross it. My mother didn't have to worry about buses and stuff like that. So we went there and then for high school, but it, um, just to touch on that is it was a regular mainstream base Yaakov Ashkenazi based sort of school. Um, but it did have like diversity of students. Like I wasn't the only Bukharian there, but there were also like Jews from different walks of life and different uh, cultures. And then for high school, there wasn't much to choose at least for my mom, like we were um, low socioeconomically, like in terms of like uh, the poverty line. So we had to find something more affordable. So I ended up in Vesagov of Bar Park High School, which is on 45th and 15th Avenue. Um, also, that was more Ashkenazi based, not as diverse, not as welcoming for me. It was an interesting time because I, I again, I didn't have the same Bukharian upbringing as most people who went to Queens and like were immersed in larger and more richer communities. Um, so I didn't have much of that. So I didn't engage too much with a lot of the Bukharian cultures outside of like the food and a little bit of language at home. Um, I, but I was like held responsible for that identity in a sense, or people like, oh, you're Bukharian. So like they would put stereotypes on me, like, oh, you're, um, you're hairy, you're loud, you're like all these like negative things, um, that I was like, oh, okay. Like that's what we are. And I didn't know enough about my identity to like combat that or to have pride in it. So for a little while, I was I was a little ashamed of like, oh, I don't know what this is. And everyone's telling me what it is, you know? And historically speaking, like when you look at um, the Bukharian Jewry and their migration with everything happening, um, a lot of the immigrants and my parents in particular uh, compromised a lot of their identity to fit in, right? So there's a lot of things my parents didn't give us because they were in survival mode and they were trying to fit in better to the community that was around them and the schools that was, were available to them. So I didn't get a lot of that, but then in high school, when I was being held like responsible or like, oh, that's your identity. They put me in a box. I'm like, okay, that's when my journey of like, who, what is it to be a Bukharian Jew started? And I started to ask those questions and explore it, um, you know, talk more to my parents about it. I didn't get a lot of information then, but as I got older, especially in the past 10 years, I was more involved in uh, taking reins on that part of my journey and like immersing myself in it um culturally uh jewishly language wise food wise everything so that's how i ended up on that trip to uzbekistan a couple of years ago cuz i was like okay let me go to like where the roots are let me let me be there and it was it was so interesting how i didn't expect it to have such an impact on me like it did like i knew it was going to make a difference but not at the capacity it did and we started in tashkent which to me is like, yeah, there was a Jewish community there. My family wasn't from there. So it was like really cool to be there, but I didn't feel as connected to it. And then we went to Bukhara and I started learning more about the history there. And then the last stop was going to Samarkand and we had gotten off the train and I was walking and like um, Menashe did a really cool thing. He led the trip and he like had these like um, drums and musical thing there. And it was like very Bukharian and very um, Jewish. And I had walked off and as, as I was walking toward the bus, I didn't realize I started crying. Right. And I felt this connection. I was like, oh, these are my people. Like I these are my people. It is my place. But my soul felt like this is where it started for me, you know, and I'm I'm here for a reason. And that changed the whole trip for me. And the three days that followed that were were very interesting. You know, I we um uh went one of the biggest things that Bukharian people do when they do these trips, it's not just the trip I did, but they are very invested in sustaining the cemeteries 
that are in in uh, um, Uzbekistan. So to me, it was really big to go to the cemetery in Samarkand. And now if you go, you'll see that um, it's not just a cemetery of tombstones, but there's actually faces on the tombstones. So it was like a, a little scary and cool at the same time because like you're not just seeing these names, but you're seeing faces. And when I ended up at the cemetery, I saw, um, my, I found my great, great, great grandfather's grave and his wife. I was like, it said 18 something, like 1881 or something. I, I forget what the number was. And I was like, what? And like my grandfather looked all cool with this, like the hat that he was wearing in the in the car, in the car picture. And then I looked at my grandmother and I also like great, great grandmother. And then I saw pictures of like great aunts and stuff. And what was really interesting was the features on their face was me. Right. And what I grew up again, a group in Bar Park, went to a predominantly like Ashkenazi school. The community is, you know, um, more Eastern European. And I like, you know, looked very different. My features were very different. And the one thing I struggled with growing up is I had a unibrow. Like I had a lot of, it had a lot of hair and I was like, I was so embarrassed. No one around me looked like it. And I would like beg my mother at a very young age. I was like, can I go do my eyebrows? Can I do my eyebrows? Like when I turned 12, it was like the biggest pivotal moment for me to like do my eyebrows to like fit in. But then when I looked at these pictures, the women like wore it with pride. Like they had those features, you know, it was giving very much like Farida Kaolo, right? Like you see that the image, and, like it's the way women were supposed to look where I was raised or were like portrayed to me was very different than what I, the lineage I came from. So when I looked at those, I was like, wow, I wear my features so differently now. Like I, I, when I look in the mirror, it's not that, oh, that unibrow or like the way my eyebrows are shaped is, a, is like a, um, a negative thing, but it's like, oh, that's lineage to my people. Like that's how my great grandmother looked like her, her cheeks and everything. So I had, it gave me more sense of pride and I was able to see that I belonged to, to something in, 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 in like in visuality, right. Something that I could connect with. So it was, uh, it was very like, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like so excited to go back now in August because I get to be like, oh, wow. Like I get to show it to other people and relive that differently. And I think I'll connect to it differently now because since that trip, I was more immersed in it and had more pr pride and really changed a lot of the trajectories for students I had worked with in the past 10 years and like making space for more Bukharian women in certain spaces where we we didn't fit in. So it's 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 crazy. It's like a whole different different identity that I was able to um, like learn about and really wear with pride. Wow. So it sounds like you have gone through a personal trajectory from more shame to more pride in your Bukharian mm -hmm. identity. And it sounds like you're trying to help others to do the same. Yes, very much so. Um, especially um, for me, it's uh, working with Bukharian women for sure. Like uh, for me, that's a big thing. Um, I will say even more so, it's not just limited to the Bukharian community. Um, I, I've done a lot of work um, in the past at least five years for sure um, to amplifying uh, diverse voices from all Mizrahi and Sephardi backgrounds. I truly believe that um, uh, I don't relate when people, when I started doing the diversity work, people were saying like, oh, um, someone asked me, how does it feel to be a minority or something? And I was like, well, hold on, hold on. Like, we're not a minority. We're just a underrepresented community. And that to me, like really mattered. And I, I do a lot of the work to make sure that community is represented um, in spaces, especially in the Jewish communal world, where like we want, I want those voices to be heard at all levels and not just at the base level. And I truly believe that if you build it, they will come. So if we really work in diversifying and amplifying our voices, voices in the larger community, larger Jewish communal world, especially at the top, then the community that we serve will reflect that and mirror that. Yeah. So that's one of the goals of this podcast is to highlight the diversity of the Jewish community. And the fact that when we think about what are our ancestral languages, people think about Yiddish and Hebrew, but they don't think about all the other languages Jews have spoken throughout history and still speak today. So mm -hmm. let's turn to let's turn to that to the question of language. You mentioned yeah. that you uh, your family has Bukharian, Russian, and Hebrew as their heritage languages. Tell us wh who speaks what. Do your parents still speak Bukharian to each other? Um, so it's really interesting. My dad, because of his mother, was raised more with Russian. She didn't speak Bukharian, um, uh, which I mean you could also refer to as Judeo Tajik for people who. Um, are interested but um she didn't speak that much so my 
his grand his parents, my grandparents would speak more in Russian. So he had more of the Russian, but because he grew up in Samarkand, he understood the Bukharian language. So he comprehended it well. So with my parents, it would be their secret language. I think that's why they didn't teach us too much of it. Like if they needed to talk about us or like deal with stuff that they didn't want us to hear, they would talk Bukharian. My mother would do more of the speaking. My father would do more of the listening and he would respond in Russian. So um, uh, it was, it's interesting. He knows some words, he didn't speak it as much, um, but he, he didn't speak like he spoke in Russian, but I remember with us, they really worked on a lot of like English speaking that was better for them and for us to fit in, right? So they didn't give us um, a huge overview of it. But um, with Russian, I think I developed it later in life. But, but with Bukharian, the few words that I did connect with started when I was young. So the language of your home growing up was English? Um, yes, it was a whole mix. Like it, I, I talked to my mom today and she could have a full sentence in me where there's English, Hebrew, Russian, and Bukharian all in one sentence. Okay. And like I find myself like talking to her and saying things that I like throw in a Hebrew word. Cause I think like, that's the word to use. And I don't realize like there's an English word for it, you know? So yeah. predominantly it was, it was English for the okay. most part with us. Okay. And then did you ever study Bukharian formally? Um, for a little bit on my own, I had found a book. I, I was trying to find it. I forgot the author, but, um, I think he's one that he taught at Queens college for a little bit, but there was a book that had like some words that you could learn. And I remember on Shabbat, me and my sisters would sit and like go through it and like try to pronounce the words and ask my mom, like, what does this mean? Does this like, how do you use it and stuff like that? So that was the only time I think I ever learned it formally. Um, but outside of that, it was more through conversation. And what I heard at weddings, at events, in the house, with my family, with my cousins. Okay, so let's turn to your heritage words. What are some words that became part of the English in your home or the mix of languages okay. that, that are specifically, let's start with Bukharian. Bukharian, I'll tell you. So um, uh, I have a whole list here. So I'm trying to see which one uh, sticks out to me more. So the first one I think that is I resonate a lot with and I use a lot is uh, chtoi. Chtoi, which means um, how are you doing? You know, like when you're welcoming each other, you're seeing each other in synagogue or when you're coming home and my mom's like, chtoi, right? Like, how are you doing? So that's something I used to um, use a lot. And in response, you would say, nahzi. everything is good. You know, like that's a thing I would use. Um, it doesn't encompass everything. I would continue my conversation in English, but like, those are words that I think even today, like with my niece, she's nine years old. So I would like, every time I see her, sometimes she calls me, she yells at me, bestie. And I'm like, Chtoyi! you know, like I, I just use it and we laugh about it, but like, I want her to have that, right? Like she, she's not going to have the same upbringing I had. Cause my sister, who's her mom doesn't speak Bukharian and Russian. And I'm like one of the only kids out of three girls in my family that really connected with language. So like I know English and Hebrew fluently, and I've invested in learning more about Bukharian and Russian, but my sister's not so much. So when it comes to my nieces and nephews, I like, I throw, I try to throw in some words in the, in the lexicon. Wow. So you're trying to pass it on to the next generations. So to speak. Yes, 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 for sure. And yeah, my sister and laughs about it. Yeah. Your, your sister laughs about it. Yeah. So, so she, she, didn't, she didn't connect it with, she didn't connect with the language so much. Um, but when I do it, then my sister will laugh and then she'll, she'll, sometimes she'll text me those words and, be, and I'll be like, okay, that's cute. You know, it's, it's, it stays with her. Your niece or your sister? My sister, my sister. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, my niece, she's, she's nine years old. She connects with all of it. She gets so excited when she meets someone Bukharian and they don't speak clearly English. Like my mom's like older family and she'll be like, oh, I know Bukharian, right? And she knows her like for sure three words and she'll say it and then they'll like start talking to her and she'll be like, mm -hmm. she'll nod her head, you know, how like she has all that confidence. But it's cute because that's what connects her to the older, like that's the gap, that that's the bridge that, that um, bridges the gap between them, you know? Yeah, so that's exactly what we're looking at in this podcast mm -hmm. is is how people use language as a connection to the past and mm -hmm. and a connection to their older living relatives. You know, we think of it as language as an heirloom that gets passed down the generations. Yeah. Things that you, you think of heirlooms as like a, a, a necklace or a ring or a kiddish cup or something like that, but it's also language, right? It's not a tangible item, but it's something that connects us to our, to our past. And so it sounds like you're really uh, connected to to the the Bukharian language. So aside from greetings, like how you doing? I'm fine. What are some other heritage words that you have? One of my favorites that my mom always uses with us, no matter what. And um, I think it's also it's a similar word in in Farsi, but it's Jonam. 
Jonam is like, um, you would say like my soul, my love, my sweet. I don't like to say love as interpretation because, and it's going to be the next lexico, next word I'm going to show you, but there is no word for love in the Bukharian language. So um, they, they say it, they, a lot of the stuff they speak is through metaphors or, you know, other things. So Jonam was the, my mother always says that to me. She'll call me, she'll text me. It's the word my sisters still use a lot, even though they don't connect too much to the language. So um, it's it's very much so um, encompassing a, like a real love. Like I see your soul. I'm thinking about you. I love you. I um, um, uh, just like it was, it was, it's very wholesome in terms of uh, a share of love. Can you give us a nickname? The context of its use. Um, my mother will call me. She'll be like, "How you doing, Jonam? Like, how you doing, my sweetie? You know?" Or mm -hmm. um, she'll send me a text message, "Jonam, what's up?" Right? Like she'll she'll put it in there. I taught her how to text. She's teaching me Bukhari, and so that's it's an even <laughs> exchange. So she'll text it to me sometimes. But it's it's the word that I hear a lot when I also go to family events. You know, like um, even my mom's siblings. Um, she has one sibling that stayed in the states, but her other two still stayed in Israel and got married and started their lives there. And they, it's interesting because my mom and her brother immersed very much so in the American culture and like whatever they had to do to survive and they compromised part of their identity. And my um, aunt and my other uncle who, who live in Israel still, they immerse themselves very much so into the Israeli culture and Israeli identity. So they also let go of a lot of the of Bukharian things. But the one thing they they all say is Jonam. And when I go to like events and stuff, even my aunts, uncles, great aunts, like family twice removed and disconnected, like that's a very uh, used word when they refer to like their kids and each other. Especially well, so this yeah, so this is a good opportunity to talk about the relationship between Bukharian and Persian. So mm -hmm. in so in Persian, there is also the word Jun or John um, mm -hmm. that is very popular. And it it's another one of these heritage words that has been passed down the generations mm -hmm. such that even people who aren't Persian but have Persian friends know that word because it's used so frequently. Um, but what do you know about the relationship between Persian and Bukharian? I don't know too much, but what I do know historically is if you go back a few thousand years, a few thousand years, you'll, there is a link where there's a migration from Iran to Uzbekistan. So there is a connection there. And I think that's where, um, why the languages do sound similar. They have some common words. And I think even um, uh, the traditions or the family dynamic is very similar and influenced. So that's, that's what I do know. Um, but I never delved into it deeper, but I did remember my father telling me that in his lineage, there was some um, uh, Persian ancestry. Okay, yeah. So I think that's right, that there is a historical connection and the Bukharian language is very similar to the Persian language. Have you ever heard people speaking Farsi and could you ever understand them? Oh, I, I hear it all the time. I don't understand a lot of the words because I don't understand a lot in Bukharian either. But I will say, like, I could pick up on it. Oh, yeah, that's that's Persian, right? Like, I, I know people talking about it. I could see the context. Some of the words um, stood out to me. Even the way they count their numbers are very similar to a certain um, degree. So there's definitely overlap, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you know a song, Jean Buz Rolle? No. Okay. Because that, I think that uses that word, John. Uh, it's a, one of the Passover songs that uh, I think it's in Bukharian on our website. Um Okay, my, so my favorite Passover song that I know in in uh, Bukharian is the Echad Mi Odea. Yeah. So that's the one. Every year, it's hilarious where we go through it and we jump from Hebrew to to um, Bukharian, and it's like Yakumin Kime Donam, and we just like that's the one thing I also do all the time every Pesach. So can, can you sing us a, a longer excerpt of that? I can try. Um, Yakumin Kime Donam, Yakumin Man Me Donam, Yakumin Chudo Rabo Ba'o Lamin. Right. It's the first one. Like. Who is that? It's like God. Um, so that that's the that's the one I know the the most. Um, do you mean I the rest just comes to me at the at the table when everybody else chimes in? I'm like, oh yeah, that's the next word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. So your family has been doing that since you were a kid at Passover? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Passover traditions over oh, very Bukharian. I would not when I was younger, because I like I said, I didn't know too much about it in the, in the school. And I, it's not me knowing about it. It's the people around me in my school life didn't know too much about it. So I didn't share a lot with them. So I would never share with people like what I did on Passover until I got late, until it was like later in my life and I had more understanding and love for it and pride in it. But like the way we would go through Magid and the way we would like hit each other with towels when we're, we're looking for the um, uh, Afikomen and like 
all those things and the way people share their stories and the way um, it's very real for my family when it comes to talking about like the exodus, right? Because then they share their migration story and like they did go through um, uh, the oppression that they experienced in Uzbekistan and how that forced them out of their homes. And they had all unique stories, like some of them very sad, some of them empowering, um, but how it led them to having to leave, you know, and there's a lot of trauma with that. And it's a conversation I have with my mom a lot where how I want to be able to um, pass down her heritage and like share a lot of those stories with my kids, but um, uh, transition the generational trauma to generational wisdom, you know, for my kids and how that's going to look like for them. So it's still very present and real for my parents. Um, it's not as present and real for me and it goes with the generations and I, it won't be as present for my kids. So the conversation is how do I ensure that that gets to them? So I definitely um, incorporate it into my life. Do you, do you have kids now? No, nope, not yet. I have uh, two nieces and one nephew and um, they are very, very disconnected compared to what I, my connection um, to my Bukharian heritage. Um, but uh, they know that they are they are Bukharian and that's about it. Mm -hmm. So um, I try my best to incorporate it, but it's not as present as for them as it was for me. Yeah. So tell us more words that you have from Bukharian, from Russian, from Hebrew, from any language. Um, Russian, I can't share too. I don't have too much. It's interesting. Um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that I work for Masa, but I when I 11 years ago, I actually did a Masa program in Israel, the Israel Teaching Fellowship, a Masa Israel Teaching Fellowship. I was placed in Ashdod and they placed me in a, a school that had a Russian migration. So I would come in and I would uh, try to teach English and they would teach me Russian. And that's where I like actually learned a lot of the Russian, but it, what didn't come from my dad, but it came from like the language exchange when I was teaching them English. Um, but I do want to, one, one of my favorites, and this says a lot about the culture, is the way that um, Bukharians say, I love you, right? They say, and if you know what that means, it actually means you find favor in my eyes. So there's no, there's, and this, when I learned this, like I used to think, oh, Mantu means I love you. And then a couple of years ago when my sister had gotten married and my cousins came from um, Israel and all over, we like had an evening. It was so cool. We're all sitting there comparing to like how our parents talk to us and how they like, you know, um, uh, like get mad at us and how they yell in, in their language. And one of the things was um, uh, we were talking about Mantu and they're like, my cousin chimes up and he goes, do you know that it means you find favor in my eyes and not I love you? And then all of us chimed in, oh, that explains so much. There's no room for love as a joke. But um, it, it said a lot about how um, culturally, like how Bukharians share love, express love, talk about love, right? So it really clarified a lot for me. But it's one of my favorites. I always uh, joke with my mom. I was like, Mantu you know, like when I hang up the phone or when I call her, when I hang out with her. But I do, I do use that one a lot. And I think it's so beautiful. Like it's a different level of uh, talking about love, I'd like to think. So, I wonder yeah. if that in Bukharian or Judeo-Tajik is an influence from Hebrew, because in biblical Hebrew, motzechen be'enai, you, you find, find favor in, in, in my eyes, eyes right? Uh, so I, I wonder if it's an influence from Hebrew or if it's like that in the non-Jewish variety of Tajik as well. Mm. Possibly. I think it's, I think languages, um, uh, for me at least, is like poetry. Like each mm -hmm. one is, uh, is, it's all expression. So, and, and which way we express ourselves, that's where we have like romantics, romanticized languages versus non and stuff like that. It's, it says a lot to me, uh, not just about, um, the, the culture, but about the well-being in that culture and the connection from person to person in that culture and how um, uh, they express belonging or seeking to belong. So that that is uh, really interesting. Absolutely. Language is such an important part of identity, community, belonging. Um, so you, you mentioned some terms of endearment and you mentioned um, some greetings. What other categories are in that list there that you made of words that you use in your family? Oh, this one you're going to love. My mom is a balabusta. She cooks a lot. So a lot of her language is in come inside and eat. So um, a sub, of some things I put down was um, jureton. Jureton is eat, you know, please eat, enjoy yourselves. Um, another one was gireton, right? Take. And um, a big one was, um, uh, I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. Droiton, come in, come in, right? It was very into welcoming, sitting at the table, eating, 
it's very Bukharian culture, very familial, very family based, very sitting together, no matter how you identified as a Jew, whether you were religious or you were Orthodox, not secular, however you identified, we all gathered around the table Friday night, right? You want to, I used to joke with my friends, you want to go to the club Friday night after Shabbat dinner, right? So it was um, even when, God forbid, like family went through tra tragedy or crises, we were always, um, uh, we always sat together for food, right? You always sit together and eat. So it was very on like, like, and if you're sitting at the table and you're not eating, my mom was like, you know, why are you not eating? Like, get, like take, take, you know? So um, those were words that I um, definitely used a lot. So it sounds like your mom used those words. Do you also use those words? Like if you're having friends over who are Bukharian, would you say those words? I usually, I use, I simplify for them because sometimes they'll be like, what did you just say if I say long words? So I usually say gid, gid, like take, take. Um, uh, I'll say nachzi a lot that I said earlier, everything good, everything good with you. Um, uh, and I'll say um, uh, huraton, huraton, eat, eat. So the, those are those are the ones that I, I will use with my friends. Uh -huh. So you are maintaining those words in your own life then. Yeah, selectively with the people that I love. <laughs> yeah. And the people that you love that are just Bukharian are also others. Oh, no, completely others. My uh, circle of friends is very diverse. Um, I didn't, like I said, I wasn't really raised predominantly in a Bukharian space outside of like synagogue and certain traditions. So a lot of my friends came from school, from college, um, from the work that I do now. So it's it's very, very um, diverse. And that only later in life, like I said, since I started doing that heritage trip and getting involved in the diversity work, did I actually grow that community of friends. So the friends that you have that are not Bukharian, to what extent do they know that these are Bukharian words? Uh, to the extent where they say, what did you just say? <laughs> I say, <laughs> this is what I said, and it's Bukharian. So they'll ask me questions on it, and I'll and they're like, but what do you mean? What's Bukharian? And I'll be like, the same way you have Yiddish, you know that that was a language that was um um that came out of the Jews in um Eastern Europe. Then you'll have Ladino, right from from Spain. Like we have, I say we have Judeo Tajik, we have Bukharian, and that's what differentiated us from the like the rest of the Uzbeki population. So that's how you so can see that we're Jewish. So even just by using these heritage words you are raising awareness about Jewish diversity and Jewish linguistic diversity. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what else is on your list? Do you you mentioned words about eating, what about words for actual foods? Oh, for foods. Oh my god, if you can pronounce them. I'm about to have dinner. My family had come in from Israel for a little bit, so I'm about to actually go to Shabbat dinner with all of them. Um my mom is one of my dreams in life is to have a cookbook with my mom. Like she, all my friends will come over. I have on Sukkot, on the holidays, on Shabbat, I have, even when I used to work for Hillel, I would have students come over for our um, Shabbat dinner. They loved her food. And even though it didn't look like the food they see at home, like they would eat it, they would taste it and they would come back for more. So my favorites that I, I love to talk about is Bach's which is the green rice. And there's so many ways to cook it in a, in a pot, in a bag, in the oven. Like, I feel like in, when the, like back in the old days, if you go back to Uzbekistan, I don't think people put the box in the oven, but in America, they've like, you know, they've um, innovatively found ways to um, cook the food differently. So box is a big one. Um, another one my friends love with my mom is plof. But we don't say plof, we say oshi plof, right? The dish of plof, right? It's not just baksh, it's oshi baksh. Um, my favorite one is osh sva, which is the food that we eat on Shabbat day that cooks overnight. So it's um, in comparison to cholent. It does not compare. I will, this is the hill I will die on. It does not compare. It's a different sort of food. It tastes delicious and on, on different flavors, but it's rice based. A lot of the food is rice-based because if you think geographically what was available to them in Central Asia um, on the Silk Road, it's going to be rice was a big, it's a big part of the diet. So that's one. Um, I love the samsas, which is like those pockets of dough with meat inside. Um, and manti is my favorite one. It's like steamed, um, I, I would say steamed dumplings, but not so much. It's shaped a little differently, but it's uh, steamed dough with meat and onions inside. Um, uh, there's one that's really hard to pronounce similar to some said, but it's a different dough. It's called gujgaje. So it's like, um, you, you could probably use like a bread dough for it, roll it out into a little circle, stuff it with meat, bake it in the oven. Sometimes you do an egg wash, little sesame seeds, make it look pretty. Um, and then, uh, one with that, that we do on the nine days when you can't have meat is, uh, bichak, 
So that's uh, same dough, but we make it in a triangle shape versus a round shape. And we stuff it with like uh, pumpkins and stuff like that, like a sweet, sweet pumpkin inside of that. Those are like the big foods that we'll eat. Mm -hmm. um, sir kanis is another one. It's similar to another food you eat on Shabbat. It's also cooked overnight with like chickpeas and there's garlic and there's um, uh, carrots and stuff. So there's a lot of so that. Yeah, it makes sense that all of these would have Bukharian words because they're specific foods that are, mm -hmm. say, samosa or, you know, wonton, <laughs> even though it's all like meat inside something doughy, yeah. right? Um, what about um, euphemisms, like terms to refer to bodily functions or body parts that might feel a little uncomfortable saying in English, and so you maintain a word from your ancestral language? There's one word. I don't know if I could say that on this on this podcast. Um, yes. The only word I ever learned that my niece my niece and nephew still use still my niece is not my nephew my niece still uses today is the word for um uh the lady parts of vagina that's the only word um it would be uh bika um i didn't i didn't know we'd get into that here but um that's the <laughs> only word and uh, my niece uses it a lot when she like goes swimming and she's like okay i need a shower i need to go you know whatever or like she has uh, some health stuff. So sometimes if she eats too much sugar, she feels something down there sometimes. And she'd be like, mommy, my bika is itching or something, oh. right? So like, it was, uh, it's very funny the way she she talks about it. But when she was a kid, she would ask me about body parts, right? So like I would, she would like, I'm, I'm always very honest and I'll answer. She's like, what's that? I'm like, oh, that's a nipple. That's an elbow. Like that's an areola. So she like a very young age, she had a, a rich vocabulary of body parts and not like made up like kid, word, kid words that people use, kid friendly words. Um, uh, and she was always very curious and asking, but the one word I never took away from her was <laughs> the word bika. She still uses it today and she doesn't, I guess it, she probably understands it now, but when she was younger, she didn't understand that it was not an English word. So in camp or in school, if she would need help or talk about it as a kid and talk to her teacher, she would say bika, you know, and they're like, what are you talking about? And then she would point at it and she would look confused, like, what do you mean you don't know? Because it was very like um, normalized for her in her day to day, you know? So that's that's the one word I can tell you that uh, was used in my house. Yeah, so it sounds I, like her parents used that with her then. Um, uh, yeah, my my mom is very close to her. So she gets that with her. Um, and then another word um, would be for breasts. So I remember it, it being jijashki. Like that's that's what it is. It sounds so much more fun in Bukharian, I'll say, you know, like <laughs> it's nicer. Like, yeah, that's that's the one word um, I remember. But wow, I didn't know we I didn't know it, we were going for that lexicon, but I'm happy that we did. Well, thank you. I appreciate your talking about those private matters. Um, so what do you think about Bukharian? Do you feel sad that it isn't being fully passed on to the next generation? Mm. It's something I think about. I, I think that. Um, naturally as generations go things will get lost um but uh i'm a big believer in um people i mean it's endangered yes and but i'm a big believer in people finding their own way within that heritage um like something i i was talking about recently and i'm hoping to publish an article on this is the way i see the word jewish and in my diversity work is the if you think of like anyone from other walks of life or religions, there's no ish at the end of it. Like if you're Muslim, you're Muslim. If you're a Christian, you're Christian. But in the Jewish language, in the Jewish like um, community, it's ish. So I, I sat with the ISH for a while. I'm like, what could it mean? What could it mean? And I came up with a whole uh, um, uh, thing on it is where I think of the I as the individual, the me, the S as the story we want to tell in connection to the H, which is the heritage we're linked to, Right which I think is collective to the Jewish people, but also individual to my own lineage, right? There's a shared collective of the Jewish peoplehood, but then I want people to remember that the I and the S is the story, is the you and the story you want to, you see yourself in as it connects to also my personal lineage as a Bukharian Jew and not just as a Jew. So oh. um, that's how, thank you. <laughs> that's how that's how I really see it. Um, I think it's so important. Um, but I also, um, I'm a little progressive in the sense where I value um, what the new generation will bring and how they process the world. And I think that what we're what we're doing right here was so important. So they have access to it. I think a lot of me not knowing things growing up is because my parents had, they lost a lot of that, right? A lot of the resources weren't um, 
saved, weren't passed down, weren't tracked, weren't recorded because of the um, immigration because of their immigration story, which wasn't a positive one. So I think that this is important to do so that they can access it and it's never going to be forgotten. Um, I think as a Jewish people, we're all about um, telling our story and we're never going to forget it. But we need things like this to ensure that there's access for them to um, reach out and find it. So the same way I reached out and found it, um, my niece can one day pull up a podcast and hear me speak and um, connect to it. So I think it is very important. Uh, but I also find that there needs to be a balance to honor um, the new generation and how that fits into their life where they are. Because I didn't grow up in Uzbekistan. So what does it mean to be Bukharian in America, right? You talk to my mom and she considers herself uh, Bukharian, Israeli, American, right? That's her That's her line. You ask me, I'm American first, and then I'm Bukharian second, and then I'm Israeli. So it's going to change for my niece. I think she's going to be American first. I think she's definitely going to be Israeli second because she connected with that the school that she's in. And then Bukharian and Russian comes in after that, right? So that's that's the that's the change that I think is going to happen, but it's still going to be in her title, right? It's still going to be in her identity and it's going to intersect. And what we're doing here today is hopefully that it can show up and enrich their lives and um, through the language or through the food, not forget what our ancestors went through for us to be in this space and for me to you to have me and you to have this conversation. Mm. Yeah, you know? right. It's not realistic to expect a generation of people who grew up in America to speak a language fluently that isn't part of their community, but it is realistic and maybe hopeful to think about using, maintaining words from that language. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, like I said, I think language is um, poetry. Language tells a story. Like wh wh why I really love Mantu Nachsmi Binam, because it also um, gives you insight, right? Into like, what did love look like or the expression of love in that community, right? You get to ask those questions, like where was it derived from? So I think that's that's the beauty of it. That's great. What other thoughts do you have about your ancestral language, identity, and community? Mm. Or your own personal ish? <laughs> My own personal ish. My own personal ish. Um, uh, I definitely feel that... Um, the new, I, I, this is what I, I've been sitting with this lately because I, I, I do, like I said earlier, I uh, lead sessions and talk about storytelling. And I think that um, we need to, what, what we do really well in the Jewish world is we equip the generations with facts, right? And that's great. But I, I think what we need to equip them is with storytelling skills and story bearing skills for this purpose here, because we want, we want to give them the tools they need to tell their story. And in relation to the heritage, that, like I said, the heritage that came before them. But then um, if we want to honor that we're in a new place, we're not where our parents started. Um, then we also have to have that healthy um, relationship to be a story bearer, to tell the story of those before us, to insert ourselves in those stories and to show that um, uh, it doesn't have a claim on us, but it has a relationship on us. It def it helps the world understand us and it helps us to let the world understand us and tell the world who we are and not have the world dictate or tell us who we are, right? Like my relationship, as I mentioned earlier, with Bukharian started because people told me who I was. People told me what they expected, what they stereotyped, right? And I said, hold on, hold on. Um, you're telling me my story. Let me go figure out what my story is, what my relationship with my story is. So that when, that's when it becomes an individual plus a collective experience. And the story bearing aspect allows me to take these words, take what I know and um, hold it true and, hel and help others see it clearer and better, right? Let others see it through the voice of the owner of the story and not through the stereotypes and the collective rumors or the collective narrative that people have formed in their minds through people who didn't look like me or didn't come from my generation or didn't come from my people and, and speak those stories. So, right. So you're rejecting, rejecting the minoritizing discourses of people who are not part of your own community, or I yeah. guess they're part of your community, but they're not part of your ancestral heritage. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just want to say, like, I'm, I'm not saying that no one else can tell my story. I, I want the whole point of us sharing our stories is that I cannot solely do the work of representing my community, right? It's also not on me. It's not my responsibility. And it is my responsibility at the same time. And the purpose of me sharing that story is that those other people can become story bearers in their storytelling, mm -hmm. right? 
so yeah. they can share it collectively. So when I, I don't have to sit there in a space and combat stereotypes and I still do it until today. And I, some people gaslight me into thinking they're still true until today. And I, I don't allow that in a nice way, obviously, but um, it's that that other person who doesn't have to look like me, doesn't have to come to the same background as me, as me can say the story factually or say it from that personal perspective, make it their own with their own voice, give the credit where credit is due, but combat it with me, right? And it's for it goes for any identity and any story. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Rosita, for the work that you're doing to share your stories and other stories, including being a guest on our podcast today. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, would love to come back one day soon. Um, but I think this is an incredible project that you're doing and I'm honored to be part of it. Okay. Thank you.